We welcome our viewers to our continuing discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Terry Ball from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University, and joining me are three of my colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture. With us today is Professor Terry Zink. Terry, Good welcome. Be here, Terry. Also joining us is Professor Michael Rhodes. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. And once again, we have with us Professor Ray Huntington. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing our in-depth study of uh, the writings of Isaiah. It's been a delightful experience, and today we get to start with uh, chapter 21. We're in a section that uh, is called the Prophecies to the Nations, probably starts with uh, chapter 10 of Isaiah and moves clear through to about uh, chapter 23. And uh, a lot of prophecies to other nations surrounding uh, Israel and Judah. Again, I think making the point that Jehovah is the God of all people in all lands, regardless of what they think of Him. Now, in this prophecy, uh, in chapter uh, 21, it says it's the prophecy, it's the burden of the desert of the sea. Now, who could that be? Well, generally it's interpreted as Babylon, because Babylon is met, mentioned further on, for example, down in verse 9, and, and uh, Babylon... Uh, is a kind of a sea of sand, <laughs> yeah. if you will, uh, with, with the uh, Euphrates uh, River running down through it. And so the analogy uh, probably uh, works. And, and uh, the uh, Euphrates River also would overflood its banks like, like the Nile did, not to the same extent, but, but it, it would be you know, a large marshy area at times of the year and, and give the imagery of a, a sea in the desert. Now, when he prophesies these other nations, the prophecies are all essentially the same. You're going to be destroyed. <laughs> and we understand that, the, that these prophecies of destruction are all a type for the destruction of the wicked at the, in the latter days. We've already destroyed Babylon a couple of times in chapter 13 and chapter 14, and we're going to do it again later on. Uh, we'll, we'll see him destroyed later. I like the way that, um, that uh, Professor Ludlow, Victor Ludlow, puts this, re these repeating themes. It's, he's, he uses the imagery that Isaiah is, uh, is making a tapestry, like you're weaving a tapestry. You, you take a thought and you weave it through one way, then you turn it around and weave it back the other way, so that after you've w woven the same th thought back and forth a few times, you end up with this beautiful tapestry that gives you the full view of what he's trying to say. So, so we shouldn't be disappointed he's destroying Babylon again, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, verse 2 uh, raises some interesting questions in regards to, uh, to the, the, uh, this prophecy concerning the, the destruction of Babylon. Now, Ray, why don't we have you read verse 2 for us, will you? Okay. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media. All the sighing thereof have I made to cease. I want you to put on your, um, your textual critic, your academic scholar hat, Ray, and you just read this verse. Tell us how you analyze it. <laughs> well, some people don't believe that Isaiah wrote it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they believe it was somebody who is latter Isaiah, if you will, um, since, at least from their academic perspective, nobody can be that uh, in tune with prophecy because Elam and media probably didn't exist or if they did Isaiah probably didn't know a whole lot about them at his, in his time period but here he is specifically telling us that Elam and media which will be part of Persia is actually going to destroy Babylon and we know that when Babylon falls it's a coalition of the Persians right. Elamites and Medes that, exactly. that conquer it yeah. so they think how can the Isaiah of the 8th century BC yeah. have ever looked at far ahead into the yeah. future. 200 not years only, into the future. Not yeah. only seen the destruction of Babylon, but given the names of two countries that, as, as you mentioned, didn't really exist at that point, and, and seeing that they would coalesce and, and, uh, and destroy Babylon. Actually, they do kind of exist at that point. Yeah, it's in just... Fact, not kind of, they, they, they do they exist do. at that point, but they're not, they're not the military they're not might not. In uh, fact, at this time, what's the relationship between Babylon, Elam, and, and Media? Do you remember that they form a coalition and conquer who? Assyria. 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 Yeah. Assyria. But yeah. now he's saying they're gonna, these former allies are going to turn enemies and conquer Babylon. Now, if you don't believe that prophets can prophesy, then you read verse 2 and, and you, you have, say... You have, you have to place it at a time subsequent to the, the event. And so that's, that's what many scholars do. That's why you come up with... Deuteronomy Isaiah or Triteronomy Isaiah, um, because, uh, for example, later on uh, Isaiah will mention the name Cyrus, and so uh, scholars who, who don't believe that the prophets have the ability to look into the future say, well, how could he 
know the na a name of a man who was, would, would come you know, hundreds of years after him and, and, and release the Jews and let them go back to Israel. Therefore, the, it, this must have been written later. Now, Latter-day Saints have a nice rebuttal to this whole argument, don't they? First of all, we believe prophets do prophesy. Do prophesy, so it's really not that much of an issue for us. Right. But we also know that many of the chapters that are ascribed to a post-Babylonian captivity Isaiah are found quoted in the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. right? And it's quoted in the Book of Mormon, where are they quoting them from? Brass plates, which, which, were which written. antedate the, the uh, Babylonian captivity yeah. and so Before. on. Before, right. meaning then that prophets <clears throat> can prophesy. This is truly a remarkable prophecy then. Here Isaiah is telling us that uh, Elam and Media are going to conquer conquer Babylon. And, and let me add one little thing here. I think that, that, that those of us who are, are Christian and who believe that there are, there are prophecies of Christ that, uh, that you know, clearly spell out Christ's life and his mission, um, you know, if, if, if Isaiah is able to see that, why don't scholars say, well, this must have been written by someone who lived after Christ was able to see his life? Or, or the passages that talk about uh, you know, Joseph Smith. Do, do we have to see an Isaiah who wrote after the days of Joseph Smith to see those prophecies fulfilled? And, yeah. and so for us, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole different point. Now, it is true that this text could have been edited and, and worked over by others besides Isaiah. But I think we were making a, a terrible choice to say this cannot be written by the 8th century Isaiah because it contains such accurate prophecy, right? And that our witness is that prophets can prophesy and how grateful we should be for that very fact. Uh, he actually speaks to Babylon going clear down through verse 10. Now, you know Babylon is a type for pride and sin and the world and so forth. As you skim through these verses, uh, 1 through uh, verse 10, anything impress you particularly about, about the prophecy concerning the destruction of Babylon? Well, uh, verses 3 and 4 particularly, he stresses that the anguish he is feeling in, in seeing this destruction. You know, this is Babylon. Babylon that he has seen is going to destroy uh, Judah, and yet uh, Isaiah has compassion upon them even in spite of their wickedness. We, we've seen this before, but this is, this is a, a prophet in, in, in reality uh, mirrors the, the anguish that our Father in Heaven feels uh, for this. And, and rather than rejoicing, oh good, my enemies are destroyed, he is, is, is filled with uh, uh, dismay. Uh, he says uh, he, uh, night pleasure is, is gone from him. The, these, these images are, mm -hmm. are, are awakening him at night. He is distressed at, at, at the, the destruction and, and, and not at all uh, happy to have to be able to prophesy ag against these people. He, he would much rather have prophesied something good, but, but he has to do what the Lord tells him. You know, an, another thing that strikes me that, that you, that adding to what you've said here, Mike, uh, how many times in the last chapters have we read at the beginning of the verse the burden of Egypt, the yeah. burden of Tyre, the burden of Moab? This is a prophet who, who, who bore messages of doom, and it must have weighed on him. I can only imagine how he, he, uh, how he felt to have this information and then, and then had to share it. Um, what a weight um, it's been a burden on this, on this prophet as well, had to carry. Yeah. I think we that's, overlook that. Maybe that's why the Lord gave him a break once in a while by giving him some of the remarkable prophecies of the millennial Messiah oh, yeah. and, the, and the mortal yeah. Messiah and what he would do. And yeah. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, after giving his prophecy in destroying Babylon in verses 1 through 10, he, uh, verses 11 through 17 is kind of a smorgasbord of other little city mm -hmm. nations that are, that are going to likewise suffer because of their, of their wickedness. And he mentions lots of them. Verse 11, Duma, which we think is probably some place that's about 250 miles east of the Dead Sea. Uh, Seir in verse 11, uh, some place southeast of the Dead Sea. Um, Arabia and Dedanaim in verse 13 and Tema, perhaps we think these are people who are descendants of uh, Abraham's third wife, Keturah. And, just, and the message is essentially the same, that yeah. I'm the God of all people and I know what's going to happen to all people. We don't know a lot about these little nations. Now, why don't we, for the, for the sake of pacing today, let's turn over to chapter 23, where he does give another burden concerning a people we know a lot about. An uh, unremarkable burden or prophecy in its own right. This is the burden of Tyre. What do we know about Tyre? <laughs> well, Tyre is, is, Tyre along with Sidon are, are the, the two uh, centers of Phoenician civilization. The Phoenicians 
if, if Babylon was, was the uh, land power, or Assyria, depending on which time period you're talking, but Assyria or, or Babylon were the land powers at, at this time, then uh, the Phoenicians were the sea power. Uh, the merchants, uh, they, they had a huge yeah. uh, mercantile empire that stretched uh, throughout the entire Mediterranean. And uh, if Babylon is, is, is the image of, of uh, you know, brutal power and military conquest, uh, Tyre and Sidon are, are the images of, of the world and economic conquest. This, this is the Wall Street of the Middle East. Exactly. That's a good and, way to put uh, it. And I think what, what the Lord is saying is, uh, I'm not, I, I don't like this power, this brute force that, that Babylon wields, but I don't like this either. Because this, uh, this, this economic power that, that is vested in these two cities, um, and, and he talks about uh, the way they've destituted the poor and how they've, how they've dealt with others. And so it's, uh, yeah. A lot, of, uh, a lot of extremes here. You're, you're the joyous city. You become poor and destitute. There's no more joy. There's, there's sorrow and so forth. Um, one part of this prophecy I think is, is uh, especially remarkable is some of, the, some of the details that we think we understand historically. Um, look with me in verse 15. It will come to pass in that day, this day that Tyre is going to be destroyed, as outlined in the previous verses. It says, Tyre shall be, be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. And after the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot and take an harp and go about the city, thou harlot that hast been forgotten, and make sweet melody. And verse 17 will come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire. Then he goes on and talks about how once again um, there's going to be some destruction. In fact, her treasures will become holiness to the Lord in verse 18. Now that phrase often means consecrated uh, for destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we make of this? I, have, have, you, have you ever heard a commentary on this idea that Tyre's going to be conquered and then have 70 years of respite and then being conquered again? Well, it, it, that, that in, in fact happens. And, and it, I, I think the Lord is saying here, you know, you, you're going to be conquered and then you're, you're going to have a, a period of respite in which uh, you, you can repent. And, and in fact, they do not. And, and they're, they're conquered again. Uh, and uh, uh, the Lord does that over and over again in history. Yeah. Gives people a chance. Uh, you know, wraps their, you know, gets their attention with that two by four and then uh, gives them a, a second chance. And uh, historically, this, this indeed uh, does take place. In fact, they seem to have been conquered right as Assyria was waning in power. So they're conquered, Very made right. a vassal, but then have almost no, no vassalage, if right. you will, for about 70 years until the Babylonians, Babylonians come. come in and, and, right. and take them. And so. Yeah. Very good. And then uh, a bit later, Alexander comes and takes them and, and so on. You know, if you, if you picture Israel and Judah on the map then, look at look what Isaiah's done in chapters 10 through 23 as he's prophesied. He talks about, uh, about the, the Philistines there in, uh, in chapter 14. And he's talked about the Moabites on this side. And he's talked about Syria and Damascus. And now he's picked up Phoenicia. He's just... It's gone all the way around. Gone all the way around. Egypt. Yeah. Egypt yeah. Yeah. and Babylon as well. Uh, I think he's done a marvelous job making the point that in spite of what the culture says, there's really only one God, the God of the whole earth, and he is Jehovah. Sandwiched in between these two prophecies to other nations, chapter 21 and 23, we have chapter 22, uh, which is a prophecy made to the Valley of Vision. What do we understand the Valley of Vision to be? Oh, it's Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. So, so now he's turned back to the covenant people just to give us a message. Um, you know, as I read this, I always think this is really two separate prophecies. Sort of, I would, if they had asked me when they were divided mm -hmm. into chapters, I would have made one through 19, one chapter, and 20 to the end another. But chapters, verses 1 through 19 are talking about a destruction of Jerusalem, right? Um, and Isaiah seems to be seeing this in vision, and there's a lot of tension here. Because, look at verse 2. What are the people in Jerusalem doing? Well, there, there seems to be, in verse 2, he says, Thou that art full of stirs, that's a noise, 
a tumultuous city, a joyous city. This, it was describing, um, you know, everyday life in Jerusalem. Yeah, in fact, if you look at verse 1, they're even up on the rooftops yeah, partying. Yeah, they're partying. Yeah. But then he says, Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor are they dead in battle. In other words, death is coming to the city, but it's not going to be by battle. It, it may be by uh, um, an army that's going to come in and, and uh, shut off the water system, shut off the food supply. People may be dying because of famine and pestilence and other things like that. How about this? He sees them up partying on the rooftops, and he observes, you're dead men. You're not slain with the sword. You're slain with what? Uh. Your, your neglect. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're un being unaware of, of, of the impending doom that is coming. Yeah. You see in verse 4 that he sees them up partying. They're having all this fun. And what is he doing? I weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoilings of the daughter of my people. So while they're partying, here's a prophet who knows what their future is and what their spiritual condition yeah. is. And all. He's weeping over them. Yeah. 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 Just weeping over them. They have trouble and a treading down of perplexity, breaking down the walls, crying to the mountains. I, I, as I read this, I, you know, we often think of it as the Babylonian conquest, but this, this would, would fit equally well with the, the, the uh, Roman conquest of 70 A.D., you know, I'm glad you said that because we can actually give a pretty, a pretty close uh, date for when this particular attack is going to come because in, later in the chapter it talks about a man named Shevna as being uh, an, one in the, in the court of the kings. Mm -hmm. And who was the conquering, uh, the attacking nation in the days of Shevna? No, that was Assyria. Assyria. Mm -hmm. yeah. Assyria. Uh, maybe another dualistic prophecy here. This, this, uh, the time yeah. is going to come when a covenant people are going to be destroyed by other nations because they no longer are entitled to the protection of Jehovah. Um, so Isaiah sees this vision. The people are out partying and he's weeping because he knows that there's an attack that's coming upon them. They're already dead spiritually and there's going to be a physical attack upon them. One of the things that's interesting, the archeologist side of me loves to look at verses eight and nine and 10 because here he's describing um, the frantic things that people will do to, pro to try and prepare for this Assyrian attack. Now we know historically that Assyria attacks around 701 B.C., attacks Jerusalem. In fulfillment of this prophecy, they attack. Hezekiah is the king at that time. He inherited being a vassal to the Assyrians because his father Ahaz had sold him out to protect him from the Assyrian Ephraim alliance earlier that, we read, that you would have studied in chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Hezekiah tried desperately to pay the, the tribute, the taxes that Assyria was demanding, and couldn't come up with enough. At one point, he will even... He'll even strip the gold off the temple <coughs> doors to yeah. send it to him to buy himself some time so he can prepare for what he knows is going to come, a siege of Jerusalem. And Isaiah must have seen that because he describes some of the things that Isaiah or Hezekiah did to prepare for this Syrian siege here in verses 8 and 9 and 10. Um, going on, he says, He discovered the covering of Judah, this is verse 8, and thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David. In other words, you've seen holes in the walls of the city of David. They are many. Ye gathered together the waters of the lower pool. Ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. And ye made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. Interpretation? They've, they've done everything they can to, to, to set up the defenses. They're, they're, where houses need to be destroyed so they can better fortify the city, they've done that. They've, 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 they've prepared um, physically to prepare for the, this, uh, this Assyrian siege. But uh, right at the end of verse 11, he says, But ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither have respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. In other words, they've... They relied on their own strength, but they haven't turned to the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, of course, the, the archaeological remains of that tunnel that they actually mm -hmm. dug through solid rock to the, the, from the Pool of uh, Siloam to, to, bring, to exactly. bring an external uh, water source into the city so that they would have water within the city. And, and as well in Jerusalem, you'll find uh, part of what they call the broad wall. And we've, we've seen yeah. that. You can actually see where that, that wall was extended to kind of bring in, um, to, to, to protect part of Jerusalem. It was unprotected. But that wall, you can see it today, actually goes through the remains of houses 
that they had to destroy to use the stones to put into that wall. And Isaiah's talking about it here. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's an you amazing know, when you go thing. to the Jewish quarter and look down in that hole and yeah. where the broad wall's been left exposed, you can see that it's not built out of great big ash logs. No. It's built out of small stones, small stones. stones of houses. And so we have archaeological evidence that what Isaiah prophesied, that you would dig a ditch or what we call Hezekiah's tunnel to bring water into the city and that you'd tear down houses to, to, to repair and build the wall to protect yourself. Uh, it really came to pass. Which is really kind of interesting that they're doing everything that you, if you're going to have a, a you know, if you're preparing for a siege, you would be concerned about your armor. You'd want to have weaponry to protect yourself. You'd want to have enough water, and you'd want to have enough protection. But yeah, like the, Terry said, despite from, it, it's not going to, it's not going to help. From a, uh, you know, a purely worldly standpoint, they're being very prudent. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're making all the preparations they can and missing the whole point of God is the one who will protect you. Yeah, exactly. and, 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 you know, that's a real lesson to us today. If we're relying upon worldly things to protect us, we're, we're going to end up just like they did. It's then going he, to fail us in the end. And then he turns his attention to Shavna, this man who's the treasurer, who's a type for the apostate covenant people, who's been spending his time making sepulchers for himself in the <laughs> valley of vision and as if he could ensure himself a good place in the next life by hewing him out a sepulcher instead of thinking about how to prepare himself a place for himself in the, in the life to come. And, and the prophecy comes in and says, Shavna, you're not going to be buried in your sepulcher. In fact, you're going to be, as it says, uh, I love this imagery in verse 18, you're going to be carried away from here and tossed like a ball into a large country. <laughs> you like oh. that because it's, he mentions your name. Too, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> Paul. You know, we do know that this Assyrian siege took place in 701 B.C., but it wasn't fulfilled like it says here because no. this prophecy makes it clear they're going to be destroyed and conquered, and they weren't. The Assyrians come, but they don't conquer Jerusalem. Because? Because prophecy is, is, is always contingent. Uh, you, you give pro the prophets give prophecy warning, and if you heed that warning, then it doesn't happen. And Hezekiah is the king at Jerusalem when the, Assyri when the Assyrian attack actually comes, and he's righteous. He, he's, he's exceptional in, in, in being one of the righteous kings. Uh, yeah. There's really only two, him and, and Josiah, that, that are righteous kings of, of all the kings of Judah or Israel. You know, if his father had been the king when the Assyrians attacked, or his son, Manasseh, had been the king when they the Assyrians have, attacked, they would have gone away. They would have been conquered. Today we talk about the 12 lost tribes That's of right. Israel. They would have been carried away like the northern tribes. But um, we see other times in scriptures where there's a prophecy of destruction that is not fulfilled because the people repent. And this is another example. The, the classic example is, is Jonah who goes to, to Nineveh, and uh, he doesn't even give him an option. He just says, you know, in a few days Nineveh will be destroyed. And he goes up on the hill to wait for that destruction. And the people of Nineveh take it upon themselves. Well, what if we repent? And they repent yeah, and the destruction is voided. Yeah. Now we need to talk about this last part of this chapter, which is one of the great prophecies in all of Isaiah in my estimation. It begins talking about a man named Eliakim. An interesting name. Um, tell us what it means, Ray. You're a Hebraist here. <laughs> it um, suggests that uh, God shall cause to arise. Something's going to arise here, which I think is a typology of the resurrection. In fact, the footnote here suggests Eliakim becomes a type for the Savior. Yeah. The prophecy essentially is going to say that Eliakim is going to take over Shavna's place. Shavna was apparently... Um, master of the house and had all the keys to open and lock and do all these things. He's going to say, Eliakim's going to take your place, Shavna. And then it turns messianic in his language. And his name is messianic. Eliakim, yeah. your God shall cause to arise. Yeah. It can also mean your God shall be lifted up or your God shall sure. be, shall raise up. So. And they all fit. Beautifully. They all fit who, what, if, as a type for the Savior because the Savior is lifted up. He does arise. And as it says, he was lifted up that he might lift all. us as well. So. The Messianic language, speaking of Eliakim, it says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And then Latter-day Saints find verse 23 particularly intriguing. And I will fasten him, this man who's a type of the Savior, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Fastened as a nail in a sure place, and he will bring glory to his father's house. In verse 24, and they, his father's house, his father's children, will bring upon him all, will, and they shall hang upon him, um, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue. 
all of the offspring, all of its brothers and sisters hang upon him. And they also hang on him vessels of small quantity, cups and flagons. What do you suppose that imagery means? Mm -hmm. Here you have him fastened with a nail in a sure place. All of his brothers and sisters come and they hang vessels and flagons and cups on him. Well, the, the imagery of, of, of uh, Christ uh, taking upon himself our sins uh, is, is, is clear. Uh, and and the, uh, the nail uh, makes it abundantly clear when we think of the, the crucifixion and uh, the, the hanging there, uh, burying all of our sins in, in these small vessels. Uh, each one of us has con a contribution to it, and, and the overall uh, weight is enormous. But but you know, it's it's little bits from each of us that, that contribute to that that suffering uh, that Christ did on our behalf. You know, another part of this imagery is the first uh, phrase in verse 24, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his Father's, Father's house. house. Everything that Jesus did in his mortal ministry was to for the glory of his father and he constantly deflected it back to the father uh, exactly. he was there to do the father's will and uh, glory be to the father we read in verse 25 that he bears all this burden while he's fastened with the nail in a sure place and then eventually it says that the nail will be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that's upon it will be cut off hmm. every time I read this I think of the line from the hymn, once in agony he bore, but he now shall bear no, more. bear no more. A wonderful prophecy of the atonement of the Savior, of his suffering on our behalf and what would accomplish for us. Thank you, brother. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.